Belfast. So please welcome uh, Andrew. All right, so thank you everyone. Um, very happy to have this opportunity to share some of my experiences with you. Um, yeah, so we, we've seen a few uh, presentation styles here. Um, we've seen cats, robots. Uh, no one's told a joke yet. Uh, I'm not going to do that. That's kind of dangerous. But I'm the first oh, baby picture. Hey. Yes. <laughs> um, so I've been at Google for about five years. I've worked on mobile for my entire uh, time there. Um, and so my talk was going to be about you know, the things I've learned over the past five years um, developing mobile applications, web applications. Um, a lot of the time, you can maybe write off three years of that to banging my head against the wall. Um, but there is some, some good stuff in there. And so I was, I was going over all my old research, and I've, I've, I've kind of tried to make a summary of uh, bad things that have happened and how we've gotten around them and uh, what's still relevant today and what's, what's less relevant. Um, so very, uh, as Remy said, I'm going to be very specific about things. And uh, one confession before I start, uh, I've never used jQuery. It's just never come up. <laughs> Wasn't expecting an applause from that. <laughs> I've heard it's quite good. Okay, so in uh, my first project, uh, mobile Gmail, so this is what it looked like. Um, so this was before Apple had an app store. Uh, this was their third party application strategy, I think. And we loved it, because uh, we already had a, a web site. Um, it was a battle, for sure. We uh, counted our startup time in seconds. Uh, and it was like 10 seconds, not like one second. Um, but that went really well. And in 2011, I, I switched to something even harder, I think, which was making the Google Docs editor editable on your mobile browser, um, a browser that didn't have content editable, a browser that wouldn't let you show the keyboard when you wanted. Um, and I learned a lot of tricks about using zero-width spaces, which I'm not going to share with you today. <laughs> um, so we, we needed to do more. So we switched docs to a native application. So I worked on the iOS uh, Google Drive application. Um, but the reason I'm even telling you this is that it's very neat. In the background, hidden, unbeknownst to the user, there is a, a web view running JavaScript. Um, and so all, all of the rendering is done in native code, but the, the network and the data model is shared with the, the web server, uh, shared with the other mobile code bases, and uh, running in the background. So it's neat design. And now I'm working on Cordova. Woo. Yay. <laughs> Not going to tell you anything about that today. OK, so I'm being very light on demos today because I want to cover a lot. Um, but I do have one demo that I always like to come back to. This is called my fast application demo. So here's, I mean, it's going to be fast because I'm loading it off my hard drive onto a really fast simulator. But I'm showing it to you anyway. Um, so you can type in number one, uh, number two, quick add. And it adds up the numbers. So quite facetious. But the point here is that a blank application, a blank web page loads really fast. So if your web application or your web page doesn't load really fast, then you've done something to make it slow. <laughs> um, so I wish I could say I made up that, that kind of tagline. But I heard it in another talk and really liked it. And so I'm just <laughs> borrowing it today. Um, and that's, that's actually a, a theme you'll see. It's me just kind of stealing other people's information. Um, so one thing. That's really been uh, a cause of a lot of head banging against the wall have been clicks on mobile. And this has gotten a lot of coverage lately, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I did, it's still worth a mention because it's still something you need to do. Um, so yeah, in my go look at what's the definitive guide kind of slide, here's uh, a really good website that shows videos of exact problems and how to get around them. Um, but I will show you using my fast app demo. So 
Uh, it's not going to really add the numbers, but you, know, you can see. Uh, can you see the flash when I click? You can't maybe tell when I'm clicking, but it, it's quite delayed. So I have another uh, where'd it go? application here that will show it a timer. So you click the button. Oh, touched. So I got a touch end event. That's when my finger came off the screen. And then I got a click event when, you know, my JavaScript stats are going to run. And there was 360 milliseconds delay between the two. Um, and this is on, like, my laptop fast simulator. So this is all intentional delay put there by the browser to help you. Um, not very happy about this decision. There are a couple tricks you can do, so I'm going to mention them briefly. So, <coughs> version two of my fast application demo. Enter number. Now, you see, one thing to point out that's different when I click on this text area, I'm doing my own highlight. This gray background is not the, the one that's bigger than the text box, it covers just the text box. And it happens right away as I click. If I click add, it happens right away. And again, I'm doing my own highlight here then. I think the button kind of goes wonky if I change the border or the background, so I just change the text color. Um, so you might want to use custom buttons. And just to see how that looks uh, on this page. Actually, is it a, where is that page? No, I'm going to skip it because I have a lot to cover. Um, but I can show another alert, you know, which does your action on the touch end, and so, of course, the delay is zero. So the takeaway here is you have to use um, large tap targets because now when you're using touch events, you're not going to have the browser fudging the user's click for you. It's not going to click the closest thing. It's going to only tap, uh, activate what you've tapped on. So use large targets. Use the CSS active class to do your highlights uh, and turn the native ones off. Use a viewport meta tag um, because on some browsers, um, I think Android browser and Chrome, and I don't know if there's any others, um, if the viewport meta tag is there and there's no action for double tap, then it just gets rid of the delay for you and you can just use clicks. Um, and like everything else in JavaScript, there's a nice library that you can just drop in and make your app mostly work better, but there are a couple caveats, so you got to read it. So JavaScript parsing, this is kind of what, I guess, made Remy interested in, in hearing what I have to say today. And I actually didn't know it was called the evil JavaScript, whatever he called it. Evil eval. Evil eval. So th that's a nice name. <laughs> um, but when, yeah, when Gmail first came out, you know, on the, the iPhone 1, 2G, and then the iPhone 3G was actually no faster, 300 kilobytes of JavaScript took three seconds just to parse it. Um, that's not running it, that's not downloading it, just to parse it. So this was like... If we could do anything to, to cut down our code size, then, then that was a real big win. And so we spent a lot of time cutting down our code size. And the other thing we did was we cut our code into different chunks, into different modules, so that we only would load the module that we needed. And so this is something, it's not, that wasn't new at the time. Gmail on the desktop and a lot of Google applications have been doing it. But the new thing was uh, that we inlined the module uh, using evil eval. And so that way, your, your page would load all the modules in one request. Um, you know, mobile, high, high latency, but pretty good throughput, and that they'd be there when you need them. You would never have to worry about them not being there when you needed to load them. And so I did a bunch of tests, like everything I could think of for how to inline this stuff. I came up with, the, like, the fastest thing was to just put the whole thing in a big block comment and then take it out and then put the script tag back in without the comment. And uh, like a lot of things, as you're going along, you realize that was actually a pretty silly thing to do. Um, because at around the same time, even a bit earlier, I, as I found out years later, uh, John Rezig, maybe I should have used jQuery, um, came up with this idea for templating, to embed your templates, where all you have to do is put type equals anything other than JavaScript, and you can put any text you want there, and it'll get inlined without uh, trying to e execute it. So uh, believe it or not, we still use comments in our uh, production code because it'd be work to change it. Um, but please, if you're doing this, Use this the way that makes much more sense. Anyway, so here's my benchmark from years back. Um, one script tag at the top to, to record your start time, and then the end time is the first line of the next script tag. So the idea here being, as soon as 
the next script is entirely parsed, it'll start executing, and then the difference between the two times is your parse time. And this worked uh, quite well to measure things, at least before. Um, and it's, here are the results. So three years ago, three seconds, as I was saying, the iPhone 4 slash Nexus S were both uh, around the same time and around the same speed, massive improvements, 10x, so 330 milliseconds for the same amount of JavaScript. Well done, we were quite happy. We like to brag that the best thing we ever did for our app was buy a new iPhone. Um, <laughs> so I redid the tests, making this talk, so my iPhone 5S, 110 milliseconds, so um, still three times faster, but I'm aligned with that because another trick that they've done uh, in the browser is that instead of parsing the entire script tag, it'll only parse the function bodies that are about to be called. And so in a typical payload, this, this last number here is the payload I used for this original three seconds. Um, with lazy parsing or the pre-parser enabled, it actually only takes 40 milliseconds for 300 kilobytes of, of function bodies. So that's a really happy thing. And so my takeaway from this section is it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, <laughs> don't waste your time chunking things up into modules. Um, you might actually hurt yourself if you lazily load them because uh, another thing it does is it parses while it downloads now. It didn't used to do that. And so don't worry about it. Be a happy baby. <laughs> okay, another really fun topic, um, <coughs> creating DOM. This used to be like what everyone building web applications would, would write articles about. Um, and it was such a problem that this guy came about, the DOM monster. Um, so I did, I did some benchmarks when uh, writing Gmail. Um, I'm just going to share them with you now the same way I did before. So there's three, three ways of creating DOM that I measured. Um, inner HTML, quite well known. Uh, Docker.create element, quite well known. And then lesser known, I think, is uh, using a temp an element and then just cloning it. Um, and then fixing up the values that you've just cloned. And so I did a benchmark. I'm going to skip it and just show you the results. I will tell you that in this benchmark number three, I cheated. So I'm only measuring the amount of time it took to clone the template. I didn't include the time it took to actually parse the template itself. So it got an unfair advantage. Um, what the benchmark does is it creates a thousand of these. So span, 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 TT with a uh, click handler. And the click handler I, I tried hooking up in different ways, which we'll go into next. And I did this 1,000 times, so it's 5,000 elements. Um, the idea here being is this is more elements than you should need. If, if, so um, for reference, a five, <laughs> Dom Monster will tell you that a five-page Google document has 5,000 elements. Desktop Gmail has 3,000. Mobile Gmail starts at 1,000 and grows over time to 2,000. So we're looking at 5,000 nodes. Uh, this should be <coughs> definitely the, the high end. So true in 2010, when I did this before, the inner HTML was the fastest. Um, and create HTML would, would sometimes be close, but it would have a lot of uh, variability because the, the garbage collector would kick in and just slow you right down sometimes. And so inner HTML I really liked because uh, it had less memory overhead uh, and was always consistent in how long it took. And it's quite easy to write. Um, so here's today. So what we're looking at here is, is compare the colors. So. Um, this is all from one device, but I'm doing WebView versus Chrome on the same device. Um, so clearly clone node has issues. If it's a really big template, this is like cloning 5,000 nodes in one call. Um, but besides that, the, the blues are pretty, pretty close. And I stuck how long the layout time was over, over here as well, just um, for reference. Um, and then in Chrome, you can see clone node of a, you know, I'd, I'd clone those five elements a thousand times, uh, was, was a clear winner. So on, uh, on my phone, the latest iOS, um, again, clone node kind of came out ahead a little bit on Safari, uh, but it's pretty close. And on the UI web view, you know, everything was quite close again. And layout took much longer than creating the DOM anyway, so uh, maybe it's not. Uh, DOM creation is less important. And interestingly, the same OS on my iPad, first generation of the Retina iPad, 
Uh, in this case, inner HTML in the web view was twice as fast as create element. So I thought that was interesting. Same software, different hardware, uh, quite a different uh, outcome. So maybe this is, you know, you should be sure to test on your devices. OK, so now that we've seen some numbers, this is why. Besides the numbers, I like inner HTML. So it's quite easy to read and to write. Um, one thing that has come up a lot more lately is called layout thrashing. So if you're, if you're using JavaScript APIs and you're, you're querying the DOM and then changing it and querying, that you're going to cause multiple layouts. And layouts, as we saw, are the same order of magnitude or much worse than creating the DOM itself anyway. So if you just use inner HTML, you just redraw your whole block. You, it's impossible to do any layout thrashing. And another interesting tidbit about HTML is that the browsers are still improving uh, the parsing of it. So currently, it's a single-threaded HTML parser in all the browsers. Uh, but Chrome, I'm, I, know, I don't know about others, are working on multi-threading. So it could be that it'll get faster, too. And then I didn't point this out the first time because I wanted to save it as kind of like a punchline. But if you look at the, the numbers we're actually looking at, for, for 5,000 nodes, which is five times as many as Gmail even has in startup, we're only looking at 150 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds. You know, This one's also kind of closer to 50 milliseconds for the creation time. So kind of the takeaway here is the same as the last section. Like, Focus on the number of nodes still, yes, but, but it doesn't really matter how you create the DOM nodes um, because browsers have come a long way, hardware's come a long way. Um, and so it's maybe we'll see a nicer monster, or not even a monster, the next time we, we start talking about the DOM. And another, another neat tidbit here is that uh, web components are very uh, centered around this, the clone note and template idea. And so I think the future is actually going to be uh, people seeing clone note a lot more. OK, so second half of this uh, benchmark is changing how you register events. Um, so old stuff, but always fun to talk about. So inline handlers versus add event list. The second one here, um, it's identical to number three in terms of performance, so I'm not going to mention it. So true in 2010, inline handlers were fastest, um, probably because the JavaScript was slower then. Um, it just parsed with the HTML, and the actual function of the, of the handler was not uh, parsed or ant nor evaluated until you actually perform the action. So this was a neat thing because, um, you know, in our module system, which we no longer need to worry about, we wouldn't even load the event handlers until after the event was fired. So the event would just say, you know, fire event number three. We say, oh, we better get the event module for this view, load up the module. Okay, now fire event three, uh, which is kind of a neat thing, I thought. Anyways, what's true today? Uh, so here's our takeaway. Having events at all uh, in my benchmark, so one event for every five nodes was between 0 and 7% uh, slower. And then if you use inline events, it actually is a bit slower now, 0 to 10% slower compared to not having any events. Um, but again, the, the takeaway here is that it's you know, 0 to 10% zero to of the thing I said was too small to care about anyway is, is too small to care about. So do whatever's easier. Uh, but the one kind of interesting thing I did stumble upon when doing this benchmark this time is on <coughs> newer Chromes, um, the inline events really took up a lot of memory. So here's a, a memory timeline of me doing my benchmark. So I use create element. Yeah, you can see my mouse. Create element um, to draw all the nodes We're using, uh, yeah, using create element. Then I click them all. And so this is firing all 1,000 handlers. Then I did a garbage collection, cleared the screen, did it again. Now I use inner HTML. So you can see it still uses less uh, DOM heap in terms of memory. Then I just used a for each loop to, to iterate all the nodes. This creates um, JavaScript side heap objects for all of the elements. And so it's about, now, now it's up to the same level as before. And then I had to use a different whole graph because it dwarfs everything when I click them all. Uh, V8 is creating a new. I guess JavaScript context object for each and every event handler that you have, and using 10 megabytes of, of heap to do that. So I, 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 it's just something to be aware about. It only affects Chrome. Um, and in the end, you're probably not going to have 1,000 events firing within a short time in your application. But I just thought it was kind of a neat thing.
thing that I found. So the takeaway here is uh, try not to use inline event handlers. Uh, I wouldn't change your app if you already do, but if you're writing a new one, it's probably best not to. And minimize the number of handlers. Uh, but again, you're talking like 0 to 10%. Uh, how I would do handlers now, um, and we did this before event delegation. It's kind of an old trick, uh, but it's a really clean pattern, so I wanted to share it. So you create your HTML like this. Instead of inline event handlers, you just add inline event names. So I say click action refresh or click action open. Then you put your click handler on the parent toolbar, and then you just you get the action out of the element's uh, target. So really old trick, uh, but really effective, and it's the fastest way to do things. All right, now for a fun topic, which everyone loves, the application cache. So I had the privilege of working with this in its infancy. Um, the good news is a lot of the bugs are fixed now. Uh, the bad news is the laundry list of caveats that come along with the intended uh, way it work, that it works. So again, this is kind of like I'm not going to say a, a ton about it. If you want to use it, go read, the, read this article, because it's the definitive, you should understand this before using it. And this is the, I included here the flow chart of logic for a, for a network request that, for a page that uses app cache. Uh, it's not as bad as it looks. So two kinds of application cache designs that I want to talk about, because these are both uh, the ones that I've seen used at Google. Well, so the first one is for mobile Gmail. Um, it's called, I called it the always-on application cache. Um, it has major performance uh, implications, makes your app much faster because it's always on. Even when you're online, you're, you're not loading your page from the network. And here's what it looks like. Um, this is, you don't have, I, I used inlining things here because this is what mobile Gmail uses, but I don't, you, you don't actually have to inline your stuff to make this work. But you would have to list some things in your manifest. So all I have in my manifest is a comment which I can change to like tell it to update, and then a network section saying, don't block me from making network requests. And uh, my main page just has HTML manifest equals my manifest file, and that's, that's all you need to do to get it to go. Um, and then the biggest, I'd say if there's, if there's one thing to know about application cache, if you don't take my advice and read the 10 caveats, just, just know there's one caveat. Um, when Gmail, when we first launched this in mobile Gmail, we didn't know about this. And that is, any page, even though it's not listed in your cache manifest that includes this manifest equals to your URL, gets added to the manifest the first time it loads as a, a master entry. A master entry is pretty much the same as any entry in this list. It'll get updated any time the cache is, you change that comment. And so our lovely login logic for older versions of mobile Gmail, would put a query parameter in your, uh, in your URL of a random number. And this random number would get through broken mobile caches. And so we didn't think much of it at the time. Like, oh, I guess that's an important thing. You know, we're all kind of new to this mobile thing, so maybe getting through caches is important. Uh, it turns out it's, it's kind of irrelevant now. But what it did do to our app is every time someone would re-log in, it would add a new entry to the application cache manifest. And then any time this changed, like you know, once a week when we launched it, the page would get re-downloaded for every single query parameter that they'd ever had. And so we actually saw in our logs, you know, what, like what something crazy is happening. And keep in mind, we inlined all of our resources. So this is like the entire page is being re-downloaded over and over and over and over again for every query parameter ever. So a bit of a, a look of horror on our face when we dug into things and figured out what's going on. Um, and actually, it used to be that it would also include fragments in here. So if you, you know, change your hash, re refresh the page, that would get another new entry, even if your query parameters didn't change. So that was a bug. It's fixed now, but it was horrible. Um, and so I meant here's, here's a snapshot of what app cache internals looks like in Chrome, uh, which is a really great way to inspect it now if you're working with it. And so, you know, do know when using always on app cache that your, your app works offline, and so you can't, and every, everyone who hits that URL is going to get the same page, so you can't put any user data in the page. You must figure out a different way to, to store user data. Or in Gmail's case, 
uh, we use a unique URL for every user because each user can get different JavaScript. Okay. This one's called the offline only application cache. This is used by desktop Google Docs. Nothing to do with performance because there are no performance benefits. But it's another, I mean, just hearing about another successful use of application cache, I think, is notable enough. So <laughs> here we go. OK, so the manifest is the same, except for now there's a fallback section, which says, you know, anything on my domain, if I'm online, offline, sorry, look at load fallback to HTML instead. Now, no, notable here is that your online page, you know, your, your, your actual page that they hit when you're <coughs> online, does not have a manifest here. Instead, it has an iframe to a page which has the manifest. And so this uh, has the effect of not adding this online page as a master entry um, so that it won't be included in the application cache. And instead, this empty iframe uh, whoops, sorry, gets added to it. So it's kind of a shows the weak, weak points of application cache there, or one of them. And then your offline page you know, also doesn't include a manifest equals because you don't need to check for a new manifest if you're offline. You know you're not going to be able to. So that's the setup. Um, I'm not going to show a demo of it because the same reason as before, but the effect is that you're, when, when you're offline, any URL you hit on your domain is going to load the fallback HTML, but the URL is going to stay at the URL the user typed in. So that's the key bit that you need to understand is you can figure out what to show the user by looking at the URL. Um, because it's not going to redirect to your fallback HTML. It's going to keep it as is. OK, so application cache, it does kind of stink, but there are big rewards if you can employ it. So um, read the article and use it, because it's what we have until something better comes along. OK, quick note while we're talking about offline. Where do you store data? in JavaScript, in memory, local storage, in a database, on your server, use the browser's cache. I'm talking about offline here. So the answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> um, and so I will I'll just point out that in, in what mobile Gmail does is it stores a lot of things in your database. A lot of prefetching goes there. Um, anything needed for initial page load goes in local storage, because that's much faster to read when you're starting up. So, a copy of that that we think you'll probably want the next time you load up goes in local storage. And then while you're using the app, we also keep a copy of everything, at least new, that goes into the database in RAM, because uh, you actually have lots of RAM compared to how much offline storage you have. And it's much, much faster. Um, yeah. Of course, you want to use your browser cache still for images. And if you have an interesting application, you'll have a server. Um, yeah, and so prefetching. You know, in the background, you can prefetch from your server to your database. And then you should also prefetch from your database to JavaScript um, to avoid delays. So the kind of the more, one of the big problems we had when building these applications is the slow or, more importantly, <coughs> flaky mobile network. And I am happy to say that that is still a problem today. <laughs> so again, re a recent talk. Uh, given that velocity, but very, very good talk, and also kind of uh, written up as an article, is Breaking the 1,000 Millisecond Barrier, where Ilya talks about, you know, everything that happens when your application starts up. Very, very good talk. So i say it again if you're, I can't really uh, beat them, but I can say go look at them, and I get some referral credit maybe. Um, but the takeaway from his talk is uh, that there's a real, like the gem here, there's a real benefit if you can get important things in the first 14 kilobytes of your payload. So Ilya says, render above the fold, if you can, in the first 14 kilobytes. And from, uh, from the work I've done, I can say one thing we've done is we made sure if your application, if your payload doesn't include the data that's important to the user, it, as is the case for an offline application, um, then also start your initial request within the first 14 kilobytes. And I can show you, uh, here's our initial design. So Top, we did exactly, actually, as Ilya is telling people now, is we had CSS to start, and then we drew our toolbar and a loading spinner, 
And then you got to watch the loading spinner while we downloaded the rest of the application, and then we parsed our JavaScript, we hooked up our event listeners, and then we sent a request to the network to actually load your document, you know, the thing that you were there to see in the first place. So I hope from that description you can see uh, the improvement that we did. Instead of drawing things first, the, the very first thing we do is we send a network request to get the document data. Um, we send an XHR. The XHR doesn't even know how to handle its own response. We just assign it to a global variable, and then down when we download, after when we download the application, uh, we now have the logic to even know what to do with it. And we actually found that putting it there, I guess now we learned it's because in the first 14 kilobytes, it was actually just as fast as if we inlined the, the payload. So it, it often managed to, to get the response to that XHR before the page even finished loading, the initial page. So that's kind of neat. Um, so there's my, my tip there. We saved up to two, two seconds on 3G just from this one secret. Okay, takeaways, talk Ilya, uh, watch Ilya's talk, and start your uh, request within the first 14 kilobytes. Uh, if, if you're also using a database, you could also so ar argue that you want to do your, your open database call there, because that is asynchronous can go at the same time. Okay, how to do your network, how to format your, your, your data on the network. So most common is JSON, uh, but one thing is still, it's just a pet peeve of mine, and I, I just found out Gmail is still actually doing this. In your request payload, a lot of people still send this form data encoding, which as you can see is really ugly, and it often expands things by like two to three times, and it's just like a legacy thing from when, before JavaScript came around and we had forms. So please don't do that. Um, use Chrome or use uh, Inspector tools to figure out if you're doing that, because sometimes libraries do it to you. Um, I don't think there's, there's no reason that I know of why you'd want to. Um, and so this, this was another kind of thing along the lines of parsing. It's in the same ballpark where we'd, we'd constantly be trying to figure out of clever tricks to parse our response payloads quicker. Um, so I did a benchmark, same as before. A few different options here. Use JSON objects, the, by far the most popular uh, option. JSON arrays only. So theory here is that maybe arrays, uh, they don't have you know, explicit keys, they'll, they'll, they'll parse faster. Um, and then if your payload is, is just a bunch of small strings, uh, then use string.split and just uh, have a separator between them. And then finally, a custom format where you just say type length data, type length data, and then you manually parse them out. And that is just kind of our, our sanity check. And so results, json.parse is three to four times faster than a val. This, then this, is, this varied a little bit, but this is kind of ish, what I found to be true. String.split, three, uh, about three times faster than json.parse for the, you know, the special case if you have, I think I use 100 byte, uh, 100 character strings, and a megabyte of them, it was three times faster. And arrays actually are faster than objects, if you have a lot of them. And then, also interestingly, on the same device, the new Chromium web view is four times faster at json.parse than the old Android web view. So under the hood in the browser, clever things are happening and they're making things faster. So that's nice. When you, all, when you add this all up, we're talking about like 10 single digit or like low tens of milliseconds spent parsing your, your payload. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Yeah, use whatever you want. Use json.parse. It's really fast now. And the network overhead is going to far uh, outweigh your, your parser time this anymore. So I, I, I should have had another happy baby here. Uh, just pretend like he's there. Uh, batching up requests. Um, this is another thing that uh, both Gmail and Docs do. And I think it's been a, um, a performance improvement. But I don't have good numbers on performance uh, in this case. It's kind of more like a, if I say it enough times, that you'll think it's a good idea because I've said it, like proof by repeated assertion. <coughs> um, so the idea is, instead of sending two network requests, you send one, and you, within that one, there are two requests. So you give it the size of your request, the ID, the type, and your payload, batch them together. Um, examples, an uh, example in Gmail is, you know, mark is read, fetch next message, the response is your new state and the message data, in Google Docs, you know, you send, give me the document, it sends you three responses, uh, the page title, 
the first page and then the rest of the pages. Um, I said this as a, as a caveat, but it's more like a stating the obvious, at least I think now, is when, when you get that response, don't wait for the entire payload. You can like, execute the response messages as they come. So we call this incremental XHR. Uh, it's a very old trick to listen to on ready state change and, and check if you have a big enough chunk that you can do something with it. Uh, the other thing uh, that this actually uh, slowed us down is, is with uploads. Upload is really slow, on, especially on mobile, but still on desktop too. And so when we added attachment upload to mobile Gmail, like the whole app would just get stuck until the, the upload was done. And so obvious, obvious uh, workaround here is don't batch large uploads. Hopefully that's obvious. Okay. We're getting to the end here. Another pet peeve of mine, timeouts. So desktop, common pattern is to just have a constant timeout for your request. Often the default's like a minute, and very rarely does anyone hit it. Um, but on mobile, on flaky, net, flaky networks, you hit it all the time, and then this happens. Because you just sit there with the <coughs> loading spinner and, and just wondering why you're wasting your time. So I, my, uh, my thinking here is that if you actually can time out, like fail faster, you're still failing, but you'll make your user happy because you're doing it quickly. <laughs> so there's, so here's, let's, let's think through the problem together here. Your, your request has three parts. You're uploading, your server's doing something, and then you're downloading your, your response. So now, we have events when you upload. Uh, this didn't used to be true, but now we have progress events. Uh, server processing time, this is where you kind of have to gauge your timeout. You know, what is your server doing? Is it going to be slow? And then the download, we've kind of always had progress events, um, as I mentioned, with the incremental XHR. So, so why are we setting a constant time timeout? So we did some real user measurements here uh, in Gmail. And the, the blue line here is the time um, between us sending the request and getting the first piece of data back. So uh, I don't have the measurements for upload events. Uh, this is just when the first byte of data comes back. And you see it peaks at around a second. It goes all the way down to, to, to 20 seconds here, but somewhere between t uh, 10 and 20 is your ideal spot. And then the, the more interesting is the red, red line, which is the time the, of a whole request, we take the longest duration between getting uh, pieces of data back, and then we log it to our server. So between uh, progress events on the download side, you can see between two and a half to five seconds will cover like 99% of your requests. Um, so much better, much better timeout scheme here is to reset your timeout every time you get an event that tells you that your, your request is still alive and well. So time to first byte, time to next byte. Uh, you probably also want to throw in separate download from upload here. Uh, just to note, uh, there's, there's now a timeout attribute. I guess IE's had this for a while. Uh, you can change it while your request is in progress, but it always has to be from the start of the request. And so I was a little bit sad that uh, there's not more to the spec here, because really the browser would have the best idea as to whether your, your request is still alive and doing well, um, but instead it's still up to you. So use dynamic timeouts. Summary here. Use a fast click library. Focus on your networking stack, because that's still really important. Um, focus on your critical rendering path, prefetch when you can. There's probably, or there rather, there is other dots that you should care about, but none that I've talked about today. Um, but a poor use of your time would be worrying about your JavaScript parse time, or your DOM creation, or your JSON parsing, uh, because those are all happy baby moments. Perf matters. Thanks. Thank you. That was, uh...